Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name's Ryan, and with me today, I have a very awesome creator. I have J.H. Williams III with me. Uh, his, his name is synonymous with greatness, in, in my opinion. So many awesome projects, works with some of my favorite writers in the business. And um, like I said before, we hit the record button. Got a chance to chat with you via email before, but I'm yeah. really stoked to be able to chat with you in person. Well, somewhat in person, you know? Um, <laughs> well, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, like I said, just synonymous with so many of my favorite titles um, over the years. I'm ashamed to say I was a little bit late to the party in terms of Promethea, and I, we'll, we'll talk about that in, okay. in a sec. Uh, but wow, holy shit, that book was just something else, man. And to just... You know, be able to even going back, watching the growth of, of, of you as an artist and to what you've been doing lately with Echo Lance, which long time coming and it was well worth the wait, in my opinion. So, cool. um, but, you know, before we, we kind of get into some of the projects uh, that that you've done, I always like to ask um, all the guests I have the first time that they're on the channel, at least, you know, maybe somebody that's not familiar with their work for whatever reason. Just a little bit of your backstory, how, you know, your fandom started and in turn, what made you want to make that leap into being a creator yourself? Okay. Um, it's pretty simple, probably pretty common for a lot of comics creators. You know, uh, you start off as being a fan growing up reading comics and stuff, you know, but for me, like I was reading comics really early. So, so early that as a kid, I was so young that I really didn't understand the context of how they were made. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to the credits box. That I think the only thing I, you know, really was really aware of, particularly if I was reading Marvel comics, was, you know, the little thing up at the top saying, presented by Stan Lee, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was really the only thing that I understood. Uh, and, and then, but I would draw. I could, I, I was drawing all the time. And so I would, you know, emulate the characters I would read. You know, mm -hmm. I would try to draw Iron Man or Spider Man or the Hulk or whatever, you know, that sort of stuff. But I was also, as a kid, super uh, obsessed with these toys called Micronauts and Shogun Warriors and things like that. Rom, the Space Knight, uh, stuff like that. So I was so, but I was really obsessed with the Micronauts toys, like insanely gonzo. And I used to go into our local 7-Eleven, you know, that was a few blocks from our house where I lived in the Bay Area at the time. And it had a comic spinner rack. This is back when those were common in pretty much any convenience store or grocery store. And I was going through it and there was a Micronauts number one from, from Marvel. And I was like, what the hell is that? I just <laughs> completely lost it. I got super excited, bought it right away. And I was so excited. I, I couldn't. I didn't, couldn't even wait to take it home to read it. I sat outside and read the thing and was just completely blown away by it because it was unlike any comic I had seen before, particularly a Marvel comic. It was pretty heady science fiction stuff for its time. Uh, the writer, Bill Mantlow, really didn't talk down to you. Writing it, it particularly the fact that he did that with uh, a concept that was based on a toy line. You know, he just ran with it. But then there was uh, Michael Golden doing the artwork and uh, Inker Al Milgram was doing the inks. I can't remember who did the colors, uh, but I was so mesmerized by this comic. I don't know if it was a combination of the uniqueness of it with my obsession over the toys, but it made me pour over every little detail. And that's when I really paid attention to the credits box and discovered the names Bill Mantlo and Michael Golden. And I was like, what you know my little head just exploded and I became obsessed with the comic book and would try to you know just everything about it really spoke to my imagination particularly being a fan of the toys how it kind of captured the essence of the uniqueness of those toys and then I had friends in school that were into comics and you know I was telling them about this comic you know Micronauts and they're like well if you like that you've got to see this other thing called uncanny x-men and that was around the claremont dave cockrum john Byrne zone mm -hmm. and i saw they introduced me to that 
and it was just as unique versus some of the other comics I had seen up until that point, or at least unique to my young eyes, uh, but different in a, unique in a way that was different than Micronauts, but it was just as, you know, riveting. That's when I was like, that was it right there. I was like, whoa, just completely blew my mind. Then I discovered, you know, the ROM, the Space Knight comic, and many other comics, and it, it drove me down a path where, particularly because I lived in the Bay Area, I had a lot of access to a wide variety of comics. So I quickly went from that to discovering Mobius and Jack Kirby and so on. Uh, I remember, you know, being introduced to the first Jack Kirby comic I was introduced to outside of the Fantastic Four was Eternals. Um, and I, I went nuts for that. And then backtrack to like Commandy that he did over at DC uh, and, you know, just went nuts and then was, you know, exposed to a lot of European stuff. And then the fact that I could draw, I sort of made this weird decision at probably eight or nine years old where I'm like, I can draw. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And I kind of like didn't give myself a choice after that. <laughs> it's just like this weird obsessive path that I, I took where I just, I, that was what I had to do. No one could tell me otherwise. <laughs> and that's how that started. <laughs> I love that you you mentioned Micronauts because you're not the first creator that mentioned that series. I think that that's, I didn't grow up with the Micronauts. I, I know of the Micronauts yeah. because of the comic and, and just knowing so much of like history of comics, but every, like so many people talk about that and it's so well regarded. Yeah. amongst creators more so than I hear amongst fans. Yeah, it's kind of, I think the newer fanship in particular haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to it because it's material that has never been reprinted. Right. Uh, outside of an artist edition that came out last year. Uh, but that's a very pricey item and you have to be very yeah. a huge Micronauts fan to want that thing, right? So that's a little disappointing. And I, you know, it gets tied up because of licenses. It was a toy that was licensed from a J Japanese company uh, and stuff like that. And so it got really convoluted and it's never been able to be re reprinted. There's, there's been, you know, sort of toying with it here and there with it getting reprinted. Because for a short time, there was a small publisher, I can't remember who, got the license, but it was a different version of the Micronauts than say what Marvel was doing. Right, and I think it was IDW. Devil's Due or something like that. Yeah, it was... and then IDW got it mm. and did a few things with it, which was glorious because, at least for me, I got to do four <laughs> yeah. Micronauts covers, right? So I was yeah, like, yeah. That, that was dope. Uh, and they were negotiating, trying to find a way to republish the original material from Marvel. And for whatever reason, I, I don't know the ins and outs, it just never materialized, which is disappointing because I think I think our, you know, collected editions of that stuff, people will be like, oh, now I understand what, you know, why this is, has resonated for so long. You know, and it's not just, I think for a lot of artists, it's the art, of course. Right. But as a storyteller, it's also the writing, you know. I've gone back and reread some of those issues as a much older adult, and I'm like, holy crap, there's some crazy stuff in here, you know, that was like talking about quantum physics and, and, time space theory or space time theory uh talking about people being able to replenish their limbs with grown limbs you know things like like a lot of weird future sciencey stuff that was embedded in that in in that it's pretty amazing <laughs> so yeah it's definitely a series i want to check out i mean i do i was able to get a copy of issue one uh -huh. But, like, I'm very skeptical on reading it because I want to make sure I can get the other ones. I don't want to read the first one and then not have <laughs> the subsequent issues because I know yeah, that yeah. that's how I am. So many series that I'll read or I'll pick up a, a volume of something that is long done. And I always regret not getting further in because I'll, yeah. I'll read, like, issue one of a trade. I'm like, oh, man, I love this. I need the next one. You know, and I'm yeah, done yeah. with it before I know it. But I think that it's interesting you talk about, like, these ideas that are so so advanced in terms of like a, what a little kid would be reading in a comic and I think that that going back and reading like Jack Kirby stuff recently 
reading like a book like Omac, which is not necessarily one of his more famous books. But I'm like, holy shit, dude, like what he's talking about in here <laughs> is like he was so I mean, and I already, always knew every time I read something, he was so far ahead of his time. Yeah. <laughs> and it just sucks that people weren't appreciating it more as it was coming out. You right. know, like especially a lot of the fourth world stuff. Uh, you yeah. know, I don't know. It's just it it's insane how how far ahead of his time was, how how great it is, how he was. I mean, he was a master, obviously. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll never forget. You know, the first time I read the Eternals as a kid, and this the scene when the Celestials come. Mm. The thing that every uh, that the Eternals and the Deviants are afraid of is happening and the celestials have come to judge the earth the creation and i remember getting to that moment and they were these massive alien beings that didn't have human faces and they're just like these giant i don't know what you would call them but they felt like space gods which is what he wanted right and i remember the, how powerful that was the the feelings he could evoke in that one moment where you're equally at awe and terrified because of what the characters are telling you this means, you know, and that they've mm -hmm. come to stay here for a year. And at the end of a year, I think it was a year, they would pass their judgment, whether it's yay or nay. And one of them has this code on his thumb that is like a, a formula that to destroy or create, right? It's yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. I know. It just, it's mind blowing. It really is. I mean, and that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what I get from, from your stuff too. Cause like I started seeing your stuff at a younger age and I mean, just what you do on the page is so unique in and of itself. Oh, you play with so many different structures of what we're looking at, like the Promethea one where it's, I, I forgot what the name is, but where it's like spiraling in and out and they're like oh, walking yeah. down. The movie is true. Yeah. yeah. Holy fuck. You know what I mean? Like, I was, like, reading, I'm like, am I reading this the right way? Was this like, I was even getting confused, but I was so in awe of what I was looking at. And, you know, the stuff you've done with Grant Morrison, you know, I really, I, the stuff you did with, with Greg Rucka, Hayden Blackman, with the Batwoman stuff has, has always been some of my favorite, favorite stuff at DC. When you decided you were going to be an artist, was that something that you, you wanted to find something that was unique to you that would leave that mark on, on fans much in the way that like Michael Golden or Jack Kirby or a Mobius kind of left that impression on you. Yeah. Yes. And no, it's not like you, when you're, when you're starting out, you just want to, you just want to create comics. And of course you want to, if you're going to make it a career, you want to build uh, a name for yourself and hopefully people will uh, gravitate to your stuff and you can build some longevity as a career. As far as, you know, having an impact of uniqueness that you know like uh, that more famous creators might have it's not i think everyone who gets in this business hopes that they bring something unique mm -hmm. to it whether that's what the the final judgment of your work will be that's it's really not up to me uh my my goals were always to um sort of to, to gain longevity and to, to sustain, to be around 20, 30 years later. Um, uh, now, as far as my unique take on comics, I don't know where that actually originates from um, other than maybe I can attribute it to my huge exposure as a, at a young age to such a diverse set of comics that it I, my mind was opened up early to explore mm -hmm. right so as a as a as a young fan i was eager to explore this diversity of comics i was exposed to and um and accept the differences between them going from a mobius western to a jack kirby eternals comic to a classic batman you know so so on and so forth um I was willing to like take it all in and be a fan of all of it. Um, and I think that combined with, in high school, I took a class called Advertising Art and Design, which was an interesting class because it wasn't so much about your raw talent, 
Um, it was more about the thinking behind the images. Um, and that kind of, I think that slowly seeped into my creative processes to where the further I got into my comics career, the more I felt comfortable trying to tap into something that was more than the surface of the page, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. um, and try to find unique ways to tell a story. And I think that also plays a part in it is, yeah, I could draw, but I never saw myself as just an artist. I think early on, I would always refer to myself as a comic book artist, but probably about 10 years in my, into my career, maybe less than, I started to view myself as a storyteller. And so that kind of, that plays a role in how you tell, how you lay out a page and all that stuff, the storytelling aspect and how that interacts with the art and how that interacts with the writing. And that led me to wanting to write and create my own stories. And I was kind of in, interested in that way early on. I think probably a lot of comic artists are, that, but they haven't explored it or haven't um, or they have explored it silently, um, developing their own concepts, uh, mm -hmm. but haven't pursued it for whatever reason. Uh, and then there's other comic artists that have done that leap from writing to art at the same at the same time, or slowly built their way into being a writer while doing artwork. Um, and I think that would make sense because it's inherent for a comic book artist to be a storyteller mm -hmm. and I think you know I'm, I'm sure many of them can relate to what I'm saying about creating their own tales that they have stories that they would like to, to do that is theirs you know however they want to approach it visually or artistically or from a right a writer standpoint they've created something that is unique to themselves and that's something I always wanted to do I, I was doing that well before I tried to be a professional comic book artist, I was, you know, inventing concepts. And, you know, Echo Lands is kind of a, a good example of that because portions of it uh, were originated from back when I was a kid. The main character existed from when I was a kid. And some of the, some of the villain aspects are from that time. Uh, of course, it's all transformed dramatically since then because of growth as a creator and coming up with different ways of thinking about the content, but the germs of it was all still there. I, somewhere, I still have some drawings of some of this stuff that hopefully, you know, I might show someday how crappy these drawings were, but like, you know, Hope Red Hood in Echolands, the, one of the defining features is that red cloak and the, the black leather pants and, you know, she's got a dagger and a, blonde hair, all this kind of stuff. That was all there from when I was a kid, you know. Uh, mm. I knew kind of what kind of setting it should be, that kind of stuff. But it wasn't fully developed as a kid until, you know, I partnered with Hayden on it uh, and was telling him about some of these ideas and, uh, and we sort of started building on, built on top of that to make it what it is. Yeah, the book's insane. I mean, not I've been saying this because I work at a, a I was working full time at a shop, um, but right now I'm part time, full time at a restaurant. But you know, when that book came out, I, I was already saying like this might be my favorite book of the year. I oh, think cool. it's just, I mean, I was waiting a long time, waiting a, <laughs> a long time for this book. I remember, like, I kind of vaguely remember when it was first announced, vaguely, uh -huh. and then I know that you had mentioned it a couple of years ago in our written interview. So it's not often, and I, 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 I know I already said this as well, it's not often when you wait this long for something, right? And uh, you're anticipating it. Sometimes it doesn't stick the landing, but yeah. this one was just by far like, uh, first of all, the widescreen format, dug, dug that. I didn't even know it was going to be widescreen until, you know, I was un unpacking the books at work, you know, <laughs> and I was like, this is awesome, dude. This is amazing. <laughs> The concept is cool. I love, like, again, it's the way you play with the pages um, that just really stands out to me always with your work. And I just progressively have seen it. You get more experimental, I guess you could say, in terms of what you're giving us visually. 
And yeah. I think that that's why every time there's a project with your name attached, it's, it's, I don't care what, I don't read the solicit. Just give me the book. Let me see. Let me just see it for myself. And it's always, always a hit in, in my eyes. Um, oh, thanks. You know, and and, kind of backtracking uh, to better answer your question about how I see my stuff that I plan on being doing unique things. And the simple answer to that is really no. It's sort of just like this natural progression evolution of just the way I look at telling a story. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't like a calculated thing. It's more, I've always operated by my gut, even all the design aspects and how experimental it gets. A lot of those decisions are made instinctually. It's not like I, I'm overly calculated about it. I don't think it's necessarily driven out of an ego to be different than the person next to me and more about what can I do that maybe I haven't seen before or mm -hmm. that it's uh, an evolution of something I have, may have seen before, you know? Yeah, I think that's more what I meant when I asked it. I think I just asked it wrong because no, 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 obviously, fine. because I, well, I think I'm listening to it as you've explained it. And I realized like, yeah, that kind of makes it sound like you just, I need to be different than everybody else. And, <laughs> and I don't, and I, and I don't think that many, I don't think that a lot of the people that I've talked to ever kind of come across that way. But like I said, like, you see Kirby's art, you know it's Kirby, right? Like right. there's certain artists that there is no question in your mind who right. that artist is when you look at him. You're one of those people. I think Andrea Sorrentino is one of those artists that over the past few years that I see his work and I'm like, oh, that's exactly who it is, right? And yeah. I think that to me, it's almost like I can see you, you just like, it's almost like you're challenging yourself with each yeah. project. You're like, how can I take this up another notch? You know, yeah. like that's, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, exactly. I, I do try to challenge myself because I feel like if I don't, I don't grow. I, I am trying to push myself to grow, to re, to uh, try to, at the barest amount, capture what I see in my head. Just if I can capture just one iota of what I see in my head, then I'm moving forward. Uh, and the, the stuff I'm doing never matches what I envision. But uh, the, for me, the goal is to try to reach that and, and grow as an artist. Um, I do think a lot of comic artists, probably this is probably even applies to fine artists and painters who there's all this influence, right? There's all these things that we're exposed to as creators or fans of comics um, or fans of fine art that have an impact on us. Uh, and that can't help but have an impact on the work that we produce and because it has an impact on the work we produce I don't think it's uh, uh, a terrible thing to say that creators are trying to find their unique voice mm -hmm. what they can what they can do that they can say that's distinctly me even if it is reminiscent of something someone else might recognize you know what I, you know what I'm saying yeah, and I think that's that's an area that I like to exist in creatively, to where what I'm doing a lot. Sometimes you can see those influences in my work, or you can see the derivative aspects of something I've done, hearkening back to something that's 20, 30 years old, uh, and I let that exist in in what I'm doing because I kind of feel like. It's my way of exploring that content and finding my voice with it while understanding there's a whole range of things out there that have impacted me as a creator and have had influence that I can't help but love. You know, I don't know, it's kind of convoluted the way I just said that, but. That's <laughs> why. Be like, okay, from the time you enter the comic industry, right? And then you, like I said, you've worked with some heavyweights, some very like, huge names in the industry. We know Grant yeah. Morrison, Greg Rucka, Alan Moore. How does working with Neil writers, <laughs> Neil Gaiman, yeah, I mean, oh yeah, I don't know, I don't know how I forgot Neil Gaiman, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of embarrassing. Um, anyways, no, fine. <laughs> uh, so for like arguably the best writers to ever write comic books, in my opinion, uh -huh. they're definitely in my top 10 of all time. And how does working with them and kind of maybe the faith 
that a writer puts in you and kind of lets you kind of breathe almost, right? Yeah. How does that elevate your art? And how does that make you kind of want to like match the type of energy that that specific writer is is bringing to a project? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd say the fact that I was that I was fortunate enough to be to hooked up be hooked up with those guys still astounds me in a lot of ways. I don't know what really brought that energy together. As far as the challenge of it, I kind of feel like they were all writers that did comics that I was fans of, and therefore they did comics I liked to read. And so when working, getting the opportunity to work with them, I'm like, this is awesome. I get to work on a comic that I would like to read, right? And that's ultimately what I think most of us as comics creators really want is to be able to work on stuff that they themselves would like to read. Now, getting hooked up with those guys and how the energy of that is so funny because when I look at some of my work that led to the the those uh, alliances happening, I don't quite get how it happened, how the connection <laughs> happened because my early work I think has got a lot of problems. But the only thing I can say is when I got the opportunity, I understood what it meant. And that because I was a fan of those creators' work, I under, also understood they're going to challenge me and challenge me on a book that I, in a way that I want to be challenged. So I kind of get the opportunity to be challenged as a creator in the way that reading their stories challenges you as a reader and so being able to connect those two threads together was awesome and made it to where I guess I by recognizing that aspect it kind of put me in the mindset I better step up to the plate I have to I have to feel like I'm respecting the material that they're providing to me much in the same mindset that I respect the content that I've read from them that I was not involved in. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of treat it with almost a sense of reverence. You know, that's kind of a weird way, term to use, but I guess it's appropriate. Um, and re really respect the material being put forward to me. While at the same time, navigating that is finding my voice with it. So it doesn't bury me. So I'm contributing something to the content that makes it somewhat unique for that author's content while still fitting into that author's content, you know, their library of work, right? Um, so that was kind of like a weird little mindfuckery thing <laughs> going on with myself. To make to to try to do that, and I also kind of looked at it like if I did, could I look at myself in the mirror if I didn't try to be one hundred and fifty percent, and be willing to put forward ideas to these same authors? They've come to me, even though they have a much more lofty library and body of work in this career that came before I ever was in the picture. The fact that I am now in the picture. I need to act as if I should be. And so I had to not be afraid to make suggestions or talk out ideas with these people. And so it was this weird compartmentalization. So like, as an example, if I'm talking on the phone with Alan Moore while we were working on Promethea, I'm very much aware. It's like, holy shit, it's fucking Alan Moore. <laughs> and my head inside is going boom, 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 exploding. But on, but the professional compartmentalization takes over and I'm now talking to him as one-on-one -on -one equals while inside I'm freaking the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but because I was able to do that mentally, it opened up the doors for, you know, I, I've never asked Alan why me. I, I, I don't think I could ask Alan why, why me, but I think, as we start working together, I would like to think that he saw how experimental I was willing to be 
just based on our conversations and my diversity of interests. And that kind of maybe helped him as a writer to be to take even more risks. And the more risks he took, the more I was willing to take risks and got to a point where like, yeah, you're gonna jump over the cliff. Okay, let's go, you know, kind yeah. of aspect to it. And it, it and I think that's probably what led to Promethea being so uh wild. I, it, it, it always would have been wild no matter who drew the thing because it's Alan's mind. But the some of the visual experimentation, I think when Alan understood that I'm willing to try anything, we both were like, well, let's try anything, any idea, you know? And it became this a synthesis. And that kind of led on to the other projects that followed, you know, like with Grant and uh, Neil and Greg Rucka and so on, where that sensibility just kept building on itself where I'm like, okay, this is what I could get away with. Well, let's apply the same type of thinking with every author that I have opportunity to work with mm -hmm. and see what can come of it. Um, and the end result is when I look back on, on the trajectory, you can see the visual connections that those projects all have similarities to them uh, in sensibilities. Uh, which is cool because then, yeah, I've worked with these giants, but when you see those connective tissues, I can say, confidently say, well, yeah, but, you know, I have a voice there too. And it's evident when you see the path between all the projects, how they relate to each other uh, in terms of um, trying to experiment and try new things, which is cool. You know, it's like, I never thought that would, I would ever get the opportunity. When I was first doing comics, I was just like, Oh, I get to draw Batman right on. I'm that that I'm good, right? I thought that was the height. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, but then quickly realized uh, I wanted to have more. I wanted to be and that be a storyteller. And working with those authors allowed me to develop that because they were, you know, unique concepts that were well beyond corporate comics, you know. So but yeah, I think that that's that's interesting. The, the because like I mean I know if I'm if I'm talking to a creator, you know what I mean. Like in, in my mind, I'm like I'm always thinking like holy shit, yeah, I'm talking to this person, you know. Like yeah. even as I'm talking, whether it's you, with no matter who I talk to, because yeah. but I have to separate that part of me when especially when I'm interviewing. Like okay, like I can't fanboy out. I can't just ask stupid questions like. Oh man, what's your favorite superhero to draw? You know, like or some or some stupid shit like that. You know, so so I totally get it in that respect. How you're like talking, how you you're on. The, I'm on the phone with Alan fucking Moore right now, and, yeah. and but you know that like no, you have to approach it as an equal because it is an equal partnership. You know, right. you are bringing his words to life visually. Right. He's not, you know, and I think that you know with Neil Gaiman, you, you entered the Sandman universe of his yeah. stuff which had been i mean like everybody knew that book right it was critically acclaimed yeah. and yeah. you're telling the before yeah and which was extremely daunting and it's still probably the, my favorite sandman story next i think it's like volume two or three that there's one of the stories but i love overture it's that's why i said i was embarrassed that i even forgot that you know what I mean? oh, like that you okay. were to nail but I, I absolutely adore that story. Um, you know, Shelly Bond, my probably my favorite editor in comics. I know she edited so, that book. Yeah. Yeah, so good. how do you, I, I just want to ask this and then we'll talk Echo Lens, but how did you approach that one where the difference, like Promethea was not an established quote unquote property, right? But Sandman yeah. was. People yeah. know Sandman. How did you kind of approach it to where like, I'm putting my stamp on Sandman. You know, I guess people do it with like Batman, Superman, and stuff like that. But this is a little, to me, this is a little way different than you know, like the countless, countless people that have been on on a Batman or yeah. other major superheroes. Sandman's Neil Gaiman. Like yeah. um, immediately, that's the name you hear uh, when you yeah. think of Sandman. So how did that? I don't know. I'm, I'm I don't know how to word it, but like, how did you approach that in the same sense, like how you did with Promethea? I guess. Is yeah. Why. Well, one of the things that helped, of course, I was a fan of the original material, um, but one of the things that helped a lot 
is the fact that the original series of Sandman was so diverse to begin with. Mm. You had such a wide variety of types of stories and types of visual presentation. That helped a lot. It allowed me to go, kind of go, okay, well, what I do isn't necessarily going to be uh, jarring to somebody who's a fan of the original material because it's so diverse. But where it became daunting is when I started talking to Neil about what the story was going to be. And he was telling me it's going to be a prequel, but sort of a sequel. Um, and I started thinking, oh, that makes things very interesting because how do we, how do I bring something to Sandman that's fresh while still feeling like a Sandman story that can circle back into the original content. And so that became a very big challenge. And then um, it was a little intimidating too, because the reverie and reverence for Sandman, ser the series was so high that I knew, you know, it was a bit intimidating to like, well, I can't fuck this up, <laughs> you know? But at the same time, Neil is a, he's an incredibly gracious person. And I had to remind myself, well, he came to me for a reason, right? He wanted me to do what I do. To such an extent that, you know, he, when I, once I got the scripts from him, there was a lot of things I did where I re would reconfigure things into double page spreads and things like that that might have originally been broken into as two separate pages. Um, so he was so uh, open to my take on uh, uh, his story that he allowed me to go in and sort of like go through the scripts as I got them and go, oh, hey, this makes me think of this. I want to do this with this idea. And I would actually put my notes into his scripts and then send it back so they could see where I kind of go where it's going to go, particularly because I don't do thumbnails. And that was kind of something that I don't know if they were aware of when they brought me, brought me in. I had to kind of explain to them, like, I'm not going to do thumbnails. I don't do thumbnails, but I will explain to you, here's my thought processes. And so they were completely open to that. The other fun, really fun thing was when, before he started writing pages, he asked me for a list of things I was interested in. You know be it a concept or an object or anything and whatever would come to my, my mind. I gave him this long list of a variety of things that I'm like, hey, this might be cool or that might be cool. As random as like insects. I, I want to draw insects, you know? Mm -hmm. And he found a way to work that stuff in in some form or another throughout the whole six issues, you know? But in terms of, uh, it was a matter of just, trying to figure out how to have it feel fresh and be a Sandman story for today's audiences while holding true to the original content. Um, I think it's successful in that regard, even though there's a lot of lot more luxurious production aspects that we have today versus comics when Sandman first started. But I think the way it's so encapsulated, the way it's done, and clever on Neil's part by having it end right where it picks up for the first series, right? Mm -hmm. So it rolls right into it. So even though it has a different, a more modern take in terms of production values, the fact that it's so encapsulated, you can kind of roll with that. You don't feel like, at least for me as a, as a reader, I would hope that they kind of, other readers kind of could agree that, you know, it doesn't feel out of place. If that makes oh, I agree. Sense. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't definitely doesn't feel out of place for sure. Yeah, and then you know when there's if there were certain things in the story where I'm like, hey, I want to try this or this this page. You know, what, what if we do this as a double page spread? Neil would be kind of like, that sounds wonderful, and he's like, I just he's like, give me that magic, you know, that what you do. So. That was a very interesting feeling having a, an author now that I had more of an established career at that point, having an author of Neil Gaiman's level 
kind of coming like, well, yeah, we came to you because we want you to do what you do, <laughs> you know, which is awesome. Again, I like I mentioned, you're, you worked with Greg Rucka on the Batwoman, then Hayden Blackman, you guys did another one where I believe you co-wrote that series. Yeah. So now you guys are doing Echo Lands, right? And like you said, this concept, this idea has been germinating in your head since you were a kid. And obviously things change as you, as you get older and your ideas are more formulated. Uh, and then I, I have to, a partner now too, you know, Hayden, yeah. Hayden's input has a huge impact as well. So as we were developing it, it became not just my idea, it came a synthesis of both of our ideas. You know what I mean? Which is right. what you want. That's makes a good collaboration. That's what you want and it becomes better and better and stronger for it because you've got a nice mix of ideas coming from different points of creative view, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, how do you feel like reading scripts from some of the, some of the, the greatest uh, writers in comics history, right? Like how does that, how does that kind of like inform the way you approach when you're writing a story? Do you kind do you feel like you've kind of picked up, tricks of the trade for lack of a better way of saying it um over the years and by the time you're able to kind of like fully do something well not by yourself but do your own thing yeah. do you feel like that that's kind of helped make you a better writer i think so in two two very distinct ways that are not related but they work in tandem i think it's made me a better writer because being open to the types of stories that those authors told in the first place, being a fan of that type of content, when I'm getting the opportunity to work on that kind of content written from them, I can see their thought processes and the unique weird ideas that they would put in there made me more confident to be uh, more accommodating and accepting of my own weird ideas, even if they've, they're old, old ones. Uh, so I think it's made me a better writer in taking risks because those guys all take risks, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's made me much better at that rather than playing it safe. I'll cite kind of a weird example of what I mean. In Batwoman, there's this weird thing that we did that is almost a throwaway idea, but it's one of my favorite ideas because it's so off kilter and so strange it really reminds me of something that one of those guys that I've gotten to work with might have come up with. And that's the villain, the hook that Hayden and I came up with when we decided, hey, let's make the hook itself a living entity that comes from another dimension. Mm -hmm. Brought for you know, brought brought onto into the world uh by this wizard character that's gonna be a you know a main character as one of the villains. And here's, so here you have this hook. It doesn't get a lot of a screen time, but it, it turns out it talks, it's got an eye. And then when it gets removed from the uh, uh, Rush, the character's name is Rush, when it gets removed from him and tossed into the ocean, it goes and possesses a crab looking for another host. <laughs> you know, no. where is it? Where did it, where did it go? That is such a weird off kilter idea. It really reminds me of some of the weird off kilter ideas I would see in comics I loved growing up with. Um, so that's sort of what I mean. That's like a re really weird, risky thing to do is put attention on this thing that has very little to do with the, the arcs of the character. You know, The other way I feel like it's made me, working with those guys has made me a better writer is attention to detail not just in the plot and characterization, but in the structure of a script. Uh, I feel like a, I'm always more comfortable having a very detailed script. I kind of feel like it needs to function as well as possible in script form. So I know it, so, so I know it works before it goes off to a, an artist. And so that played a big role like when Hayden and I were writing scripts for other artists on our Batwoman run, you know, for the issues I didn't draw myself, was to, to make sure that those scripts function, that the mechanics of the scenes function, and all the, and all the visual details are clear in the script of things that we're looking for, 
So they can be a little bit dense. I'd say not as dense as an Alan Moore script, but working with someone like Alan Moore certainly taught me it's important to have those details there to be have thought that out instead of just leaving it all up to the artist. You want the artist to have freedoms, of course. I had tremendous freedoms on Promethea. But at the same time, you know, you as a writer, you also want to make sure that you're not just being fluff or whatever that's thought out. Yeah. So it's made me a better writer, but in some ways it's also made me a better artist too, to such an extent, like when I write my my scripts for stuff I'm drawing myself, you know, or well, scripts that even Hayden and I are, are writing together, they're for me to draw. And so I, tr I write those scripts the same way I would write for any other artist, even though I'm gonna draw it, I don't take shorthands. And it's good practice to make sure that you're not missing a, a, what might seem like a small detail, but could be an important beat. You don't want to miss that kind of stuff or continuity issues. But then when it comes down to drawing from my scripts, where I'm drawing from them myself, I treat them the same way as I would any other writer. So even though I've written it and I'll have visual ideas plugged in there and say, oh, I kind of see the scene from the writing standpoint, like it could function like this. Maybe the layout works like this, but when it comes time to draw it, I might now see it differently and I'll do it differently. <laughs> so, uh, and in, as, as long as the story is still maintained, that's the most important part. But um, yeah, working with those guys, I don't see, you know, if you're gonna step in the writing shoes and you've worked with those guys for years, like I got the opportunity to, I, I don't see how it couldn't impact the way you approach things and, and and be a stronger creator for it because you know in my view as no matter what talent i have in the writing department you know what those guys do is is by far more realized in a lot of ways they've had so much more experience and i have to make uh, and i have to i understand that and so I, I really uh, take to heart the things I learned during that time. In one way, it's a little bit spoiled me as a writer working off of say, scripts from Alan is because his scripts are so detailed, I can't help but write detailed scripts. It's sort of like the scripts he gave me was like, I relished the detail because it was so informative and it helped me grow as an artist to, to uh, make a better page in terms of like, the world building aspects, you know? Yeah, so it, it, it made it to where like when I write scripts myself, I can't help but think in you know, high levels of detail. But I don't go into the same amount that Alan, Alan does. I don't, I, I mean, you know, I probably could if I wanted to, but <laughs> it's like, I don't think, <laughs> I think I would not do it as well <laughs> as he does. So I think the level of detail in the scripts is sort of floats in between, say, the scripts I got from Greg to Alan in level of detail. Greg Rucka would write very detailed scripts too. And so, but I, I don't know, I kind of go back and forth. I know I'm kind of being long-winded here, but uh, I kind of go back and forth. There's some scenes where Hayden and I will have the scripts be very simple and, uh, and not bog, out, bog down the panel descriptions. Uh, but then there's other parts where we're like, okay, here's three paragraphs for to set the scene before we write panel one. You know what I mean? So it goes, I think maybe because I had opportunity to work with all those different writers, it kind of made my scripting processes more diverse. So there's little pieces of each of those guys. Yeah. In, yeah. in terms of the way they structure the, the, the uh, format of the script that, yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense for sure. I mean, they're all each one of them has their own unique style. In yeah, like even sure. when you're reading it. I mean, I've not I don't think I've seen every one of their scripts. I know I've seen obviously I've seen Alan's scripts because it's like back matter in some of the books that I've gotten, yeah. right? And then Greg Ruck, I don't think I've seen his scripts. Um, oh. but Neil Gaiman, I I'm pretty sure I've seen his also in back matter. But yeah, everybody has a different style and that's kind of cool that you're like almost like an amalgamation 
of all these grades in terms of what you can you take what works for you and yes and, and then you put that into your into your own writing and yes that's the perfect succinct sentence of everything i've just tried to say for the last five minutes <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, well, I mean, I was listening to us, so I, I was just able to formulate my, my thought and kind of put it together. Uh, but I think that, you know, like just going from, you know, Batwoman and years later, now you guys are doing this Echo Lands book finally. Um, do you feel like because it's taken longer that you've you've been able to kind of work out and polish it into something better than maybe if you did it? like say three, four years ago, maybe it would have been a completely different book. I think so, for sure. Even, okay, so Echo Lands was something, before it was even called Echo Lands back then, um, was something that Hayden and I had been developing for a long time. And it existed before we even uh, jumped onto Batwoman as a writing team. Uh, and the way the whole, you know, it was something that Hayden and I were always going to build towards we just didn't know when, you know, when it was going to come out. Uh, and then the Batwoman uh, job presented itself. And I was like, you know, this is a perfect opportunity for Hayden and I to explore writing something else. Um, and so because we got that opportunity to work on Batwoman together, we could kind of get a better sense of how each of us like to structure a story and structure individual scenes or how experimental we want to get with this part, but maybe more traditional with this part and so on and so forth. So all that time on Batwoman, I think uh, was very good for us as a writing team to develop what that interaction is like rather than just our interaction on developing a concept. Because at that point, Echo Lens was only a concept. We didn't really know what it would what it would look like on on the page at that point so uh yeah that one gave us a lot of great opportunities and i i think if if uh if we had tried to do echo lands before batwoman it would have certainly been a completely different animal i think in, in many respects the core pieces would still be the same but the execution might be different um the way the scripting uh the way the scenes play out probably would have been dramatically different and then that just built upon itself even further when overture came because overture kind of came the plan was was for me to go do echo lands when we were done with batwoman whenever that was going to be we hadn't had an ending for batwoman in mind at that point just that was just going to be the next thing i had actually set up a publishing deal for echo lands before Batwoman was done, but then Overture came and everyone involved, Hayden, the publisher, you know, for Echo Land's Image Comics, they were like, no, you gotta go do that. And that turned into a big, long thing, right? That took a long time to get done. But again, it taught me more lessons on what I could try in Echo Land's, you know? The things that happened, oop, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, oh. Yeah, uh, sorry. I don't. I no, okay. my my mouse was over the button. This is stop video. <laughs> so, so what? And then you know the, the things I talk about at the end of the issue, first issue in my uh, afterward about all the life chaos that happened. You know, that probably had an impact on what we did with Echo Lands as well, in terms of how aggressive we wanted to be with it, how much personal effort and personal energy. I wanted to devote to. I think all that stuff had an impact, you know. So I would like to hope, like to think it made it better than if we had tried to put it out years ago. You know, like if Overture never happened, it, as an example, it would be a completely different thing, you know. And then, yeah. you know, in the meantime, you know, like after that one, we had the opportunity to develop a couple other concepts. One of them, we came up with a whole pitch document for. You know, all that interaction with Hay between Hayden and I, the more we worked together, the more it affects what we do now. You know, so yeah, definitely I th it's better for all that happening, even though it's been a long road. I kind of come of the mind 
things happen when they're going to happen, when they happen yep. when they're supposed to. Whether it's a giant success or not, it's the, the, the event is happening at that point because that was the time it was meant to happen. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason and it happens when it's supposed to happen and not before. You know, yeah. like, and everything that, it all leads up and it all prepares you for that inevitable project or task or whatever in yeah. your life at whatever moment, like significant moment. And um, like I said, I, I love, I love the book. I think that the widescreen format, I'm kind of curious the decision behind that. You, a lot of mixed media in terms of like visually what we get yeah, black and white. I mean, just like you play around with so many different things and I just, I want to kind of get your take on what you, why the widescreen, what visually do you want to do with this book that maybe you haven't had the opportunity to do in past projects? So when Hayden and I first were developing Echo Lands, I can't remember at what, we had been talking about it for a little while, kind of figuring out the bigger picture of what this thing is. Not, not necessarily all the complete nuts and bolts of it, but understanding it as a as a core concept of what its potential could be so we had been working on it for probably a couple of years at that point on various conversations on and off and one of the things along the way i started thinking about for i can't remember i maybe had seen a a, a comic strip style book you know because it sort of reminds me of that like a strip format in a way but like a different evolution of that but I was like, what could we do with Echo Lands that visually might give us something unique compared to, you know, anything else we've done before? And I started thinking about like, what if we did it landscaped? You know, what if we turned it on the side and did it landscaped? We're, we knew it was going to be an epic story to begin with, this epic style concept storytelling. So perhaps we start thinking about like what well, we turn on the side and then my my uh obsession with double page spreads and mm -hmm. how they can function from left to right whether it's a, a single image or 14 panels or whatever i'm always fascinated by the expansion of the space and so I, when i started thinking when we started thinking about the landscape thing i'm like well that could be kind of cool because then here we're doing an epic style storytelling adventures tale. If we turn it sideways and do a landscape and we focus on this panoramic aspect, that can maybe buy us a lot of, um, of the feeling we want from it when people read it, the feeling of it being bigger than normal, broader than normal. Uh, and so that we just sort of building it towards that. We didn't, but when we start writing the scripts for it, what's fascinating about this is before I even started drawing it too, I, I knew we, you know, that we were gonna deal with the landscape, but in my mind, this is dumb. In my mind, I'm like, it's, it'll be a piece of cake. It's the same measurements. It's just turned on its side. It's just doing it differently. I'm not making the pages bigger or smaller or anything like that thinking, oh, it'll be, it'll be easy. It'll be, it'll be just like drawing another comic book. No. I learned very quickly when we were draw, drawing the first couple issues how challenging the format was. It changed everything about how I think about how a page moves from, from the beginning to the end of the, of the scene. It changes everything. And that actually affects the way we write the scenes too, because uh, you're dealing with like all the text, everything fits differently. So like right. the amount of dialogue you have is gonna fit differently than if it's a portrait style comic. It's just gonna, it just is, is that way. But so there's some give and take there, but the end result is, you know, there's some scenes where I, when I was done with them, I look at them like, oh, that produced something I didn't even, consider the feel of it i'm like that almost feels like a tapestry or or a, a mural yeah or you know like this weird 
it does this weird thing to you to your mind when you look at it um and so when i was cr in the creative process it, every decision we make on echo lands is affected by the format more so now than when we first started because there was a lot of learning lessons in there things that would work great in a portrait style comic don't work on here or things that work great on this format don't work so great in a standard format so right. there's a lot of like navigating that we're still learning our ways around like we still write scenes where when i get into the drawing part of it because i've envisioned it working in comics for you know 25 plus years or whatever you automatically think in portrait style right so converting my mind into that is tough. So when we're writing a scene in my head, I can see it, but my head still is trying to kind of configure it as a portrait style comic. And so some of the writing is dealing with that format, but then we take into consideration, well, we are a landscape. So the scene needs to function like this, thinking we have it nailed, right? But then yeah. when I get into the drawing part, I'm like, nope, it's still not quite working right. And so I have to make weird little adjustments that weren't planned for in the scripting stage that come into play. And that sometimes can affect, oh, okay, well, the space here worked out differently. So this line of dialogue, you know what? It's two times longer than it can fit. So how do we change the dialogue to accommodate the space and still say the same thing? Stuff like that. It's, just, it's like this weird process. Well, I don't know if we'll ever get a full grasp on it because you know, working in comics for so long, you're kind of, the portrait style is almost automatic, right? Right, right, so right. Fighting against that. But then there's other occasions where, like the Batman black and white thing that I did last year, that's was going back to a portrait style double page spread setup. But that was after had working on Echolands for a little bit. So Echolands kind of spoiled me in a way too, because like there's bits of that where I'm like, oh, this would look so great if I had this much <laughs> more room to stretch it out, right? Yeah. You know, so it's like I'm in this middle ground part right now where I'm like, I, you know, the portrait style thing has an impact, but then I'm spoiled by this and kind of like, well, now I want all my, all my comics to be in this format you know, from now on. <laughs> so it's... Uh, do, you, do you think you'll continue to work in this format then with any subsequent projects or do you think that you're going to kind of wait and see at the end of it. Cause you said you're still like, you're still kind of getting the grasp on in terms of when you're writing the script and then you're putting it to pencil to paper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's a wait and see kind of thing. You know, I do kind of feel like we've kind of cornered ourselves a little bit. So like if, if echo lands becomes this giant success and we, we want to do say a spinoff series or, something else where maybe another artist comes in and we are just the writing team and we're doing a spin-off series following one of the peripheral characters uh for a story we're going to be forcing that artist into this format that they might not be comfortable with yeah but we have to stick to the format because that is the world we have set up you know what i mean mm -hmm. i i i think it'd be disastrous to do a series of echo lands books that are spin-offs that are a different format. I mean, how would you put that on your shelf? <laughs> you know, it's yeah, yeah. need to go together. But as far as applying this format to other tales, you know, I could I could see doing that. Uh, honestly, I, I really like the feel of it, um, the broadness of it. Even though there's different ki other kinds of limitations, there's something that feels uh, really cool and it allows you allows me to experiment in a different way. That was the other thing I was going to get to was when we came up with doing this format we knew we were going to do something we don't normally do and that was a, almost the the whole sole reason to do it was because we had so it was almost like let's do the experiment for just the pure sake of the challenge of the experiment well, if it's a fail if it fails it fails you know uh, but it's worth trying than not trying so but then as we started working on it we started the the idea of the experiment the format experiment fed into the creativity side of of it if that makes sense um and it's allowed me to visually 
experiment on the flow of scenes differently than other comics I've had the opportunity to work on because of that. So I, now a lot of the stuff I'm doing in, in Echo Lands, occasionally I still have the thing where you turn to a spread and I want you to go spread, boom, right? But there's other parts of Echo Lands where I'm more about the flow, where I'm more about the left to right flow mm -hmm. as you move along. Um, that becomes more evident as the series progresses. So I like that that feels different than other things I've done while still, you know, you look at it and you're this clearly a comic I would make. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. so what do you what do you envision for this series? Like how many issues do you have in the can? And do you have somewhere in your mind, is is this the type of book that could kind of continue on and 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 kind of be endless almost or yeah. do you have kind of an ending in mind at least for this maybe current iteration if if all you got was like whatever this current iteration is do you have an ending in sight uh we know where we're going it's one of those types of stories particularly which is sort of evident on page one because page one is sort of like a snippet of the future of the character right mm -hmm. so right on page one it's clear we know where we're headed we don't know how long it will take us to get there we uh, have a certain idea in mind but as we start writing that's the other thing i'd like to point out is there's p bits and pieces of, of the writing that has evolved that differ dramatically from our original outline our original outline had everything in it from a to z but as we start writing scripts and uh, introducing ourselves to some of the peripheral characters, those peripheral characters start becoming something more to us. And so they're getting expansions within the story, which mm -hmm. means the thing go grows longer. Uh, so we're not quite sure how long it'll take us to get to our main point. But Echolands has always been designed from the beginning to be, like you said, kind of endless. This is one tale within the Echolands which is, you know, this is Hope's story in the Echo Lands. And through the course of her story, it sets up the parameters of what the Echo Lands are for the readers to understand that anything is possible. So once that, once they understand how we explain that, why this book is so diversely crazy, uh, there's a reason for all of it. Once that is revealed, and we get to the end of Hope's story after that, then it's wide open. We can tell any type of story in any kind of genre we want to. Whether Hayden and I will continue it beyond that, we don't know. We, it's like, that's a decision we don't want to make at this point. Or would it be something where we co-write and, and work with other creators to bring in their, their visions into some of it? Or we take a break and then return to it for a different story yeah, we, we just don't know. But it's, yeah, it's kind of one of those things that it, as it's developing, it's telling us what we need to do. And so that's why we've kind of not set uh, an end date or a, a number of issues to get to where we're going because we kind of okay. really don't know at this point other than we know the details of the story. But so, like I said, the, the format also challenges us in some ways where some scenes end up taking us longer than we realize uh to 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 get across the point which changes the way the the story progresses um but in terms of production i'm uh drawing issue seven right now the page i don't know if you got to see the pages i posted up on uh on twitter and instagram i posted a, a spread on there that's from issue seven uh that's pages four and five of issue seven um, I'm gonna look for it. So yeah, I'm in the middle of issue seven, but parts of the end of issue six and parts of issue seven and parts of issue eight all deal with this one particular part of the reality we've built. That's a particular style that eats up an insane amount of time to draw. Like the spread I put up, I think took me. Oh fuck! Oh, so shit. Okay. You know, and it because yeah so there's different parts of the series will take longer than other parts it's just the way the nature of it dealing with different styles and stuff 
but yeah, so I'm on, I started working on pages six and seven um, uh, yesterday, and then we've started the writing on issue eight. So issue eight um, is in its first, first draft stage. So. Oh man, I'm so stoked. I mean, just, I, I can't wait to see where it goes. And I'm so glad that you're so far out on it too. Uh, you also have the raw editions where we're going to get to see the uncolored. I, I think that that's really awesome that you guys are doing that as well. What is are the plans for collected editions too? This is more a, a personal question because I, I really love hardcovers. So I was just wondering if that's something that you guys have thought about. Are you going to do traditional trade? What's what is the the plan for that in terms of how you want to collect it, and uh, like what are the arcs? I guess even like how many issues per arc? Yeah, um, right now it looks like this was a. a it's so funny because the outline has changed so much. There was a certain point in the story that we wanted to get to that we thought would be a perfect ending point for book one, you know, for a collected edition. But the way the story is developed, that's just not going to be possible. So. We just had to say, okay, well, at the end of this issue, this is going to be our cliffhanger for book one, whatever that cliffhanger is, which might be fine. It's more like the season of a TV show in that regard, you know. So when I was talking to Image about, you know, the book lengths, you know, the original thought was that we would have once we once we figured out, okay, we're not going to get to the certain point that we wanted to for for book one because it's just not logistically possible. We're like, well, do we break it at issue five, being the end of the first arc? But then when it came down to the writing, I was like, nope, that's not going to work. The be better place to break it is at the end of issue six. And when I was talking to Image, I'm like, you know, but the next one we could do at five issues you know, or whatever, and, and Image was kind of like, you know, no, you know, readers and retailers like consistency, so let's just plan on each of them being six, you know, for each volume, which, okay, that makes sense, and with it being more of a, like, seasons of a TV show that's telling one big story, those breaks just happen when they happen, hopefully at really great places, we're keeping that in mind, where we're like, where you're like, oh, shit, what does that mean, or where does that gonna what, what happens next uh, as far as the the types of collections we're gonna do we're still talking about that uh we have we're, we're probably gonna be making solid plans for that pretty soon mm -hmm. um hopefully we can do that the book does well enough we can do deluxe versions and all that kind of stuff for people um and as far as the raw cuts i don't know if the raw cuts will end up in any of the collective material those might just stand on their own unless if maybe way down the road, like if we get to do years down the road, an absolute style book where it's ginormous, yeah. then maybe the raw cut stuff could be in that. The fun thing about the raw cut, I'll say, which I haven't had the opportunity to tell anyone before because I hadn't thought about it. I was just like, oh, it's the artwork, the way it looks leaving my studio, whether it's, you know, some of it will be have painted bits some of it will have color that I did myself before it went over to Dave. So each issue has like this weird mix of things. The lettering is all translucent. So all the bubbles, like the color of the bubble, if it's a black colored bubble or a white colored bubble or gray or whatever, the bubble part's translucent. So you can see artwork through it. It makes it a little bit tougher to read the, diet, the, the text, but it's still readable. But the fun thing I was thinking about, I hadn't thought about this, like errors I might have made that went in and fixed after, those are still in the raw cut. Like, nice. so there'll be little continuity errors where, like, as an example, Hope has this bracelet and there was parts where I, I kept forgetting to draw the bracelet. And then I went and did that after the fact. Well, the artwork that's in the raw cut doesn't have, it has the mistakes. You know? so, yeah. But I think what's fun, uh, it's sort of like, um, hopefully for, you know, comics aficionados are interested in what things look like mid-stage, sort of like middle of the process kind of vibe going on with it. A little bit like the Salmon Overture um, special editions that, that were done, where we did that. So like anything, if I painted something that's still intact, uh, or if I 
color the panel or whatever. That's all. I think people will be surprised as, as, as it goes along. They're like, oh, weird. Why is this character? This character is painted in every scene, but <laughs> no one else is, <laughs> you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. <laughs> and and you're you mostly, you're traditional and, and mixed with digital. I, I'm just curious how the, what your preferred like medium is in terms of producing your art. It's traditional. That's, I, I mean, all traditional. I um, love that. To such an extent, it creates a little bit of a headache in some regards, but I'd rather have it have the headache and then have a complete piece. So as an example, when you see the raw cuts and you'll see some sequences where maybe this one character, is every scene he's in, he's painted. Mm -hmm. Or the characters end up having this rocket ship and the rocket ship is all painted. I painted it in every scene but those are done on the same board. So the painted parts sit next to the line art all on the same board. But where it becomes kind of a headache is in the production process, in the scanning process. So I have to, when I do that stuff, I have to scan it twice, then layer out the, the painted parts. So they're separate from any of the digital color that Dave might do. So yeah, everything all exists on, on, all on the board. Um, yeah I, that's awesome i love I, that. I, I love hearing that some about what i like about it is um it's sort of like i have to live with what's there you know i can't go in in unless if it's a major mistake where like you're where i forgot to draw in the character's bracelet as an example i didn't draw it when i fixed those i didn't fix those drawing it in digitally i did drawings of the bracelet scanned them and then cropped them into the, into the file you know but there's some instances where okay if uh there's this one scene where digital processes come into play there's this one scene where we have the rocket ship the rocket ship is painted on the board in full color i used colored ink on that instead of paint um but treated it like paint or that, but then I wanted to tackle the environment that the rocket ship is in, and that's all done in black and white artwork on the board. But because I had such some something very particular in mind, I colored that myself using using Photoshop. So that will print the way I the way I turned it in. So that when people go through the raw cuts, that might be a little confusing in some ways because I don't I. We, we don't bother to explain the process and the raw cuts. I, I didn't have time to do like a commentary feature, which would have been cool. I would like to have done that, but yeah, not of time. <laughs> I mean, I'm super stoked for stuff like that. Cause I, you know, artist editions are, they'll, they'll set you back some money, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I kind of pick and choose when I get them, especially if I'm like, this one seems like it might be more niche and it might go out of print and then i'm gonna have yeah. to drop like three four hundred dollars on it then i yeah. make sure i buy them right away you know yeah but to be able to get this on a monthly basis you know we get one issue echo lens and we get the raw the yeah. same month that we get the next issue and i think that that's yeah. a really cool idea that you guys came up with and cool i mean i'm super stoked to get it because i love seeing process i'm not an artist myself but uh -huh. i love seeing the process of stuff that's why i still by Blu-rays, you know, like, cause I like the special features, you know, so I, I'm yeah. super stoked for all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It just, we thought like, it was just like this fun thing to do, you know, uh, when we started thinking about the rollout for Echo Lands, you know, image was, you know, like trying to look for unique ideas to, for unique things we could offer because the series was unique in you know, I mentioned to, to them about what we did with Overture, where they did those special editions. I don't remember why the special editions for Overture happened, other than they were just looking for something to fall in between the regular issues. I don't know, to kind of like keep attention. Mm -hmm. But when I mentioned the special editions that we did for Overture to Image, you know, they were kind of like, yeah, let's do that. Let's do something like that then. And I'm like, are you sure? Because this is going to be a long series where Overture is, you know, was only six issues. But we're going to hopefully do these raw cuts for every issue as we go, which is, I think, 
think anyone's ever done that before. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely not that I know of. So, um, yeah, no, I, like I said, it's it's a unique thing for a unique book. Uh, I think anybody that's listening, watching, if if you haven't already picked up Echo Lens, make sure you go pick it up from your local shop. You can also listen to my buddy Dylan and I on our weekly uh, read. We also reviewed the book uh, the week it came out. I mean, I both of us were singing its praises and cool. um, just su super stoked to see what, what else you have coming up for the book. I'm very, very excited about it. And is there anything else that you have in the works or is it solely Echo Lens right now is the main focus? Uh, it's solely Echo Lands right now. I, I did eight pages of a thing uh, a couple months ago, but I don't know if I can talk about it. I don't know what their how their promotion bit is. Sort of music related. Uh, but af after I did that, I'm like, okay, I, yeah, I, I don't have time to do anything else other than Echo Lands, especially as I start getting into, like I was saying, that how long that spread took. When right. I start getting into that, I'm like, no, this is this is just too much time, and there's no way to make up the difference on time to do anything else. You know, uh, it's unfortunate because uh, you know I get cover gig offers here and there, things like that. So, uh, but I just don't have the time. <laughs> just don't have the time to do them. But hopefully, you know, Echo Lands will be enough, and people will dig it, and you know. It's more than enough, more than enough. And I, 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 I mean, everybody, I, I, I can't say it enough. Go pick this book up. It's phenomenal. So, I mean, our shop still has copies of number one. I know we're going to have the, the raw cut editions. One more thing before I let you go. Sure. Your playlist in the back of issue one uh -huh. is not just a few tracks. It's albums. Yeah. <laughs> I love music. Like I'm a huge music head, all genres, and that and you have all genres. I mean, yeah. it's just my. That, I think that was one of the main conversation pieces. My buddy and I were talking about was cool. look at this fucking playlist. <laughs> it's it's insanity. You know, all those albums. You were listening to stuff from all those albums while creating yeah. this book. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's um, true. we're we're. Uh, because we have a, um, of course, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and, you know, that sort of stuff. But, we, you know, in the book, we have an email that people can write to called the Red Hood Club, where people can talk, you know, if they have questions about the series or whatever. And after getting quite a few letters, it's clear and seeing comments on other platforms that to, to us about the book. It's the the playlist feature is popular as hell. I love it. It's like yeah, I, it's amazing to me because I when it, when I decided to do it, I got the, again got the idea to put that in there because the um sa the Salmon Overture Special Editions published playlist in that. Um, so I thought, oh, we should do that for for Echo Lands too because it'd be it's just fun. But you know, I knew it would take up a you know, a couple pages, and I, at first I'm like, ah, is anyone really gonna give a shit? I mean, that's a lot of, you know, stuff to, uh, for people to pay attention to, but it's been super popular. People love that feature, and I, that's so cool. The biggest question I've been asked about the playlist in relation to the work is, does the music affect my work? And at this point, no, because my music selection is so like you said it's so um every genre diverse genre of music but in the fact that it's so diverse uh selections it kind of speaks to what echo lands is because echo lands is this mash of everything right so it's really cool i'm glad you like that feature because it's it's uh i it's love fun it we're doing it in every issue so um and as far as like a lot of albums i mean when you're working, you know, on this stuff, you know, eight to 10 hours a day, you can listen to quite a bit of music. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. And I mean, you said that one double page was like 10 days. So that's, that's a lot of music yeah. right there. That's only two pages of work. So, yeah. um, no, I think it's, I, it's a feature that I wish more creators would do. I, I mean, I love, it's like getting reading lists to me too, uh -huh. like, like reading recs, like yep. knowing that this is the type of 
stuff that influenced the writing or the music that you were listening to while creating some of the most breathtaking art that's ever been in a comic book. And I just, I really dig that kind of stuff because I love, yeah, I too. I, and sometimes I learn about, you know, I'm like, who is that? I've never even heard of that singer. Or I've never heard of that band or whatever. And then I just, I'm discovering new stuff from something that, you know, like from a comic book that it's not necessarily the thing you would think you would discover new music from. Yeah. But it really gets you inside the head of the creator. And I think I've asked, I, I think I've asked a few artists myself, like, what music do you listen to uh -huh. while, while creating? I don't need to ask you that because you gave me a four page <laughs> list, a four page <laughs> list of, of albums. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I'm kudos on that, putting that in the book. I think it's awesome. And I can't wait to see what else you, uh, what else you're listening to while creating this stuff. Cool. Cool. I'm stoked that you like that feature. I, I'm, yeah. I'm amazed at how popular that feature is. <laughs> so. I mean, again, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that just, you know, like wants to see more of that. It's, it's nice supplemental material to get inside the comic book. And it just really, you more than get your money's worth out of the book. Like that's how yeah. I feel from the paper oh, yeah, stock yeah. that you put the, the paper stock you guys chose the format, the quality of the book is just all there. You have the back matter where you and Hayden each, you know, talk to us as the readers, give us yeah. some insight. And then you got the playlist. So, um, yeah, like I the, said, the, the interview with the villain section. Yeah, that was, dumb. that's going to be in every issue. It's like, okay. It's like one long interview. The fun part about that is as the interview parts progress with each issue, there's different parts of the interview sections that become a little bit connected to what's happening in that issue okay. like little plot bits that might appear in the interviews or the or the a scene in the issue references the interview stuff like that and then there's a part as we go the interview pro process almost becomes its own narrative that can that sits alongside of what the other events are which is kind of cool uh we have a plan for that i think that'd be pretty cool that, um, that's one of our favorite bits is to write that that interview and it allows us to kind of um, tell a little bit more about the world uh, that you can't fit into the story itself without feeling like a shoehorned exposition yeah so no for sure history, over the next parts you get little bits of clues about their the characters notions about the history of the place or or things that they're trying to discover about the history of the place or things that happened, you know, that the villain, the villain talks about his personal life in places where so you're like, oh, that's interesting. That's really weird what he's talking about right there. Stuff that we can't show you in the main story because the main story, it's a fast paced adventure part, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, it's, no, it's, it's cool. I love, my favorite comics did that kind of stuff like back matter stuff, you know, where it's like, oh, this newspaper article is giving me something that, the, the part of the story doesn't, you know, so it adds and enriches the whole thing. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a huge fan of stuff like that, huge fan. And again, I I can't say enough good things about the book, um, about your work. I think that, you know, you guys have really created something unique and special on the stands at a time where I don't get as much unique projects like this you know and I just I, and I think us as comic book fans when we see something like this um and it just it just stands out I, that's why it had such a profound effect and why it's really resonated with me and it sticks with me and I I just can't wait to see the success of the book and continue to read this for years to come well no, I, I really appreciate that and uh, thank you very much you know because earlier in our conversation we talked about things coming out or things happen when at the right time. The last couple of weeks I've been thinking about the timing of Echo Lands coming out and the type of story that it is. Yeah, we're being experimental and trying some things that you don't normally see, but first and foremost, we want it to be fun. You know, I think people, after all the things that the country's been through for years now, and we're still kind of in the middle of the latest problem with the pandemic. Right. You know, it's like, I don't know, I, I myself, I'm like, damn, I need some fun, <laughs> you know, some something that has 
fun to it. And I, my hopes is that Echo Lands kind of has that energy to it. And, and maybe that's one of the things people are attracted to by it for it is, you know, they can sense that we're just wanting to entertain, you know, we want to give people something, well, it's something uh, interesting and thoughtful. It's still like this adventure tale. It's a fun story. Even if it gets super serious as we go, you're fun and excited to see that seriousness. You know what I mean? If that, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, so. yeah, it makes sense, man. Like I said, it's a book that I feel like you could hand anybody, you know, yeah. and 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 I think anybody could pick it up and enjoy it. And it, it kind of it kind of reminded me of how I felt about Fables when Fables first uh -huh. came out. You know, like that kind of you could hand that book any kind of comic book fan yeah and more often than nine times out of ten they're gonna dig the book because it also like it was all over the place it was so many yeah. it touched on so many different genres and that's and that's always been one of my favorite series and i think that that's what I, i'm loving about echo Lens already with just the one issue is like i feel like it's gonna fill it's gonna fill in that void that i've kind of been missing <laughs> in terms of that type of book and that type of story so uh can't wait for more and, you know, before I let you out of here, I was wondering if you could just, you know, share with everybody listening and watching where they can find you online. And I'm going to drop all the links down below for them to find. Okay. There's my website, which is jhwilliams3.com. I have a message button feature on there. At some point, the site's going to get refreshed. We just don't know when. But I can be contacted through there. I can be contacted through uh, the Red Hood Club at gmail.com which is the official letter writing email for Echo Lands. Social media, I, uh, I can be found on Facebook, but I'm not on there very much, but you can find me there. Uh, I'm on Twitter a lot and I'm on Instagram. So my Twitter is uh, uh, at Jake Williams three or a mad wizard, um, or, uh, Jake Williams the third, sorry. And same with Instagram, Instagram matches, so. All right, cool, man. Well, th again, thank you so much for taking time to, to chat with me. I had a blast talking with cool. you, and I definitely want to do this with you again and unpack sure. some more uh, more comic talk with you. Sure, that'd be great. All right, man. Well, thank you, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks. Bye.